Hello, everybody. My name is Eric Krieg, and as you probably already know, this group is FACT, the Philadelphia Association for Critical Thinking. We advocate science and uh, reason in our world. Uh, it seems like there's always a need for that out there. Uh, we used to respond to more claims of the paranormal, um, th things uh, like, like uh, cults, fads, scams, anything particularly involving the lack of critical thinking, but we also uh, like to have lectures promoting real science, particularly vanguard science, where uh, there's new things coming out just to show that the science and the skeptic community isn't just knee-jerk naysayers, but we embrace possible change, particularly where you have evidence of it. Um, and we have uh, uh, we do projects with science fairs, giving out awards. We have a considerable web page presence. We used to have a newsletter. Um, we welcome members to join us. Our web page is phact uh, dot org. Our coming. Uh, we also have lectures, and our speaker that we have for uh, for next time will be Robert Hicks who was formerly, I think, major caretaker of the Mütter Museum um, with the College of Physicians. And he'll be speaking about 19th century astronomy. He's a big history buff. And then in March, we'll have Ted Dashler of the Academy of Natural Sciences. Uh, we happen to love him in the skeptics community because he discovered essentially the Darwin uh, fish, te tectolic. But he's moved on to all kinds of uh, other neat stuff, digging up in the, the earth and finding uh, facts about creatures that used to be. And then in April, we'll have Rob Palmer again saying uh, a, a speech on uh, what is the harm of physics. And uh, then uh, I know we have someone after, after that, but all you got to do is follow our webpage for, for that. So our speaker uh, of today has uh, spoken, I, I think he's close to the record, about five times. Um, he's a uh, uh, professor uh, nearby at St. Joseph's University. He does all kinds of promotion of science and yes. physics on his own time. Among his many books, some he's spoken about in the past are uh, Flashes of Creation, Synchronicity, The Quantum Labyrinth, Einstein's Dice and Schrodinger's uh, Cat, Edge of the Universe, uh, C Collider, What Has Science Ever Done for Us, Brave New Universe, The Great Beyond. But uh, today we'll learn all about his latest uh, book, The uh, Allure of the Multiverse. Hopefully some of you are also uh, Marvel fans and uh, we, we, we might hear more about that. So uh, if we were in person, I'd tell you to please join me in welcoming Clap, 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 our speaker uh, for today, Paul Halporn. <laughs> Take it away, Paul. Hello, everyone. Hello. And make sure uh, everyone else is uh, muted, please, right now, so that um, I don't get feedback as I'm wearing headphones. Um, so anyway, thank you for all coming to this virtual event. Wish I could see you all in person. But it's exciting because this is my first virtual event about my book. So without further ado, I'm going to share a, a PowerPoint about my book. So you see a little bit about it. And hopefully you all see this. And um, oops. So my book is called The Allure of the Multiverse. And even though I've talked about many different topics to fact, including um, planets, uh, particle physics, and, um, and the Big Bang Theory, I think you all would probably agree that this is my biggest topic ever, but probably one of my more hypothetical or more far-reaching topics, because it's unclear if this can be confirmed using observation. But... Um, but this is um, something that I've become interested in in recent years, and also especially because of the um, the movies and TV shows and so forth ha that have come out in recent years about this topic. So in recent years, there's been a deluge of activities, uh, films, 
movies, series with fictional multiverse depictions. So I have a few here. I'm sure there are a lot more, but one of the more one of the more famous ones is Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. And um, I, I recently published an article, if you, you're interested, if you Google for it, it's called the T Top 10 Movies About the Multiverse. So uh, I included my favorites. And this one I saw, it was okay, but it wasn't in my top 10 favorites um, because um, one critique of this film is that the multiverse was used in some ways to put in a lot of cameos of Marvel characters that just would appear on the screen. You wouldn't really know why they were there and then they would disappear. And recently Patrick Stewart, uh, who plays the Marvel character uh, 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 in the X-Men series, um, uh, was said that he really didn't like his performance on, in, this, in this movie. So uh, there were certain uh, certain grudges about the movie being too too much uh, cameos with it, which didn't really make too much sense to the movie plot. Um, a real classic, which I saw um, fairly recently, was Spider Man Into the Spider Verse. I haven't seen Spider Man Across the Spider Verse yet, but I heard it's really good too. And this reintroduced the Spider Man series with a new version of Spider-Man and instead of Peter Parker becoming Spider-Man by being bitten by a radioactive spider, you have Miles Morales who grew up in a very different background um, being uh, bitten by a radioactive spider and the same thing happened but he was kind of a reluctant Spider-Man and then he was joined in his quest in, in the first movie uh, into the Spider-Verse by a uh, middle-aged Peter Parker uh, with some, you know, wasn't quite the same as the original, but, and then they met all these other uh, Spider-Men from other um, parallel universes. So that was really interesting. It had amazing animation. And then um, this is the first and the only multiverse film, as far as I know, to win multiple Academy Awards, Everything Everywhere All at Once, about Evelyn Wong, who uh, runs a laundromat or laundrette in the UK. And uh, she uh, finds out that there are all these parallel universes, versions of her that uh, achieved greatness in some way, a great singer, great chef, great martial artist. And she manages to encounter them and absorb all of their characteristics and become kind of a superhero from that point of view. And I enjoyed that film, although at some point it was so fast paced, it was a little bit hard to follow. So that is, those are my mini critiques of those films. Oops. So a question I asked uh, is why does the multiverse have such an appeal to the public? Why are there so many films out about the multiverse? And one has to do with the idea of frontiers. So uh, imagine being confined to a region and not knowing what's out there beyond the region. You would naturally have a certain amount of curiosity about what lies beyond. For example, if you lived in Philadelphia your entire life and you enjoy the restaurants, the shops and, and so forth, and you, um, you, you had a great time in Philadelphia, but for some reason there was some kind of barrier that prevented people from leaving Philadelphia. And you just heard rumors that somewhere out there, there was a city called New York, which had a lot of culture too, and uh, theaters and cinema and so forth. You might be like, hey, wait a minute, why can't I visit that? And suppose you were told that it's impossible to visit New York, you would still probably look for any sign or any evidence that, of what New York is like. You'd be really um, curious about it. And similarly, we're confined to the observable universe, which is extraordinarily large. It is um, something like 46 billion light years uh, uh, in radius, uh, but it is a kind of bubble and science 
can't see what lies beyond the observable universe. So we can take our telescopes and see galaxies that are now 46 billion light years away. And that's because at the time they gave off their light, they were much closer, but because of the expansion of the universe, they move very far away from us. But that's about as far as we can see. And um, so it's a little bit discouraging that no signal can travel faster than light as far as we know. So that means that we can't see anything beyond 46 billion years, light years out there. So it's uh, really uh, a bit of a, uh, you know, a bit of a problem for astronomy that eventually, if we someday map out the observable universe, there's still is speculation about what lies beyond it. Like if we talk about the observable universe, we want to extrapolate to the entire universe, but we might not be able to do so. For example, if we talk about the universe is flat, meaning geometrically kind of like a box that extends in all directions, then if we say the universe is flat, then how do we know that it keeps going like that out to infinity? Or if somewhere beyond the observable universe, somehow its geometry changes and becomes curved instead of flat. We really don't know, and there's no way of detecting that directly. We can only use indirect detection. And the other question that um, we wonder about is the what if questions. And that might even be a, a bigger driver of the multiverse and culture. The what if questions about what would have happened in our lives if we made different choices. Like for example, if let's say, instead of moving to Philadelphia, we move to Cleveland or you know, move to London or someplace like that, what would our lives be like? Um, what would happen if we chose a different job or a different career? And what would have happened if we made different choices for partners in relationships? These are questions that people often wonder about. And usually optimists conclude that they made all the good choices and uh, pessimists might uh, think that they made all bad choices. But uh, realistically in life, we just don't know whether the choices could have been different because we can't see these parallel strands. We don't know what it would have been like if we moved to a different city or different town or we took up a different career. We can only speculate. So for example, suppose you are trying to catch a train and you, um, you reach it and the conductor is just closing the doors and you yell to the conductor, uh, please hold the doors open for me. And the conductor does so. And you run up and you catch the train and you might breathe a sigh of relief at that point and might say, oh, wow, you know, otherwise I would have had to wait it for longer. Now I have extra time. I don't have to rush. I could just relax. But, um, you know, that sense that you were lucky could very well be false. So, for example, if that train uh, unfortunately got into an accident or if, you know, by catching that train and you got off somewhere where there was an accident or a catastrophe um, at that point, like, you know, a tree branch fell you know, just when you were leaving the train station or something like that, um, you might say to yourself, oh, if only I had missed a train, that would have been much better. So you just don't know. And also things could happen like you catch a train and you meet someone who's the person of your dreams. You say, wow, if, if I didn't catch that train, you know, I wouldn't have been so lucky as to meet uh, Mr. or Ms. Wright. But then if you um, if you missed a train, maybe the same thing would have happened. You would have met the partner of your dreams. So you just don't know, um, you know, and there's no way of telling. But we can dream about alternative realities and alternative branches um, in which other things happened. Now, one of my favorite multiverse films of all time, and I highly recommend it, is the film Sliding Doors. And that, that film, the character played by Gwyneth Paltrow um, is working at an office in London and she gets uh, fired and she's very upset. 
and she goes down to catch a tube train and this child is in her way as she's running to catch a tube train and she just misses it and the doors close hence the name of the movie right before she gets on the train and she misses it and because of that all these things happen she takes a taxi instead and she gets mugged i don't want to give too much away and then all of a sudden um when she just misses the train sorry the when she just misses the train uh the camera uh reverses the, the film and the film goes backward in time and now in this slightly different scenario the mother of the child pulls the child away so that the child is not blocking her from running for the train and she runs and she catches the train and after she catches the train she gets on and she um goes home where her boyfriend is waiting and she discovers that her boyfriend is having an affair and uh breaks up with her boyfriend ends up miss meeting a person who's much better and then the film continues from there so the film shows the two branches of reality and it's very interesting the similarities and differences between the two branches of reality and then not to give too much away there's a twist ending and you wonder which was the best branch the one where she made the train or the one where she missed the train i won't say anything more than that but that's a great film about um the the, the that slight changes can make a big difference another film that came out the same year as that was a german film run lola run where there are not just two different scenarios three different scenarios and in the first two they end up being fatal and this third scenario is successful so i recommend that one too but you know these are all movies what about science does science uh offer multiverse too and and the answer is yes in theoretical physics the multiverse has become very popular in recent years starting in the 1970s so discussion of multiverse ideas in physics is about 50 years old. The term multiverse, interestingly enough, may have been coined by William James, the philosopher and psychologist, who talked about a moral multiverse, which was a universe that's neither good nor bad, but somehow is a combination of the two, a combination of good and bad. So it's morally ambiguous. And uh, that's where the term multiverse comes from. He called it a moral multiverse. But um, in physics, the term stems from um, some models that were developed in, in, or popularized in the 1970s. And some physicists really believe that there are parallel universes in reality to which react reactions are mixed. Um, some physicists respond by saying, don't talk about science fiction. And some people in the public think that when physicists talk about the multiverse, it's like the Marvel universe where you can walk through a portal and meet a doppelganger or a near identical version of yourself or another Spider-Man or something like that. Well, the, the multiverse in physics is very different from that. So let me talk a little bit about the history of ideas of the multiverse in physics, which is the gist of my book. So the story of interest in the multiverse begins with the late years of Albert Einstein. So Albert Einstein died in 1955. And a few years ago, I gave a talk about Albert Einstein for fact, from my based on my book, Al Einstein's Dice. So um, you can refer back to that for more information about Einstein. But uh, Einstein, Albert Einstein, one of his last talks in 1954, um, was something that ended up stimulating multiverse ideas. So um, sometimes people say about Einstein that he was such a genius that even when he was wrong in his critiques or you know his ideas, that it still stimulated so much interest in other things that he ended up being right anyway. So the, the occasion of the talk, which took place in Princeton, was that John Wheeler, who's this gentleman on the right here, invited 
Albert Einstein to speak to his relativity class. It was the first relativity class at Princeton ever um, and addressed both special and general relativity. And the fellow in the middle is Hideki Yukawa, another eminent physicist. But this story more has to do with John Wheeler inviting Albert Einstein to his relativity class. And in the class, Einstein spoke about a lot of things. And one of the things he said, talked about was his um, critiques of the orthodox view of quantum mechanics. So orthodox quantum mechanics was originally proposed in the 1920s and greatly enhanced by work by John von Neumann in the late 1920s and early 1930s. John von Neumann was this amazing genius. We're talking about a lot of geniuses here. So Einstein was a genius. John von Neumann was a, a great genius, born in Hungary, but moved to the United States, was a colleague of Einstein at the Institute for Advanced Study for a while. And von Neumann took the philosophy of Niels Bohr about quantum physics and lent it mathematical oomph. So Niels Bohr said, that a quantum system is like a black box and that we really don't know what's inside a quantum system. But the way we can find out is by asking questions. And he called this idea complementarity, that um, by asking questions about a system, the system yields secrets. Much like if you went to one of these um, uh, psychic media, sometimes there are these, uh, I saw this recently in the, village of New Hope, uh, these machines, you put in a quarter and you ask a question and you get a response. So quantum physics is a little bit like that. You ask a question and you get a response. And um, so the quantum system is, we have to forget about what's going on inside. We only say what the result is. And then the outside world, according to Niels Bohr, is perfectly regular. It's, it's, you know, obeys the laws of Newtonian physics. So we, we can, you know, predict, for example, if you throw a baseball, where it's going to land and so forth. So um, quantum, world, quantum world and classical world are very different. So, and, and that seems a little strange, like to draw this artificial barrier between the two, especially since people are made of atoms. Uh, so the uh, question is why uh, they don't obey the quantum world too, but let's put that point aside for a second. So as John von Neumann showed, uh, each time a researcher cho chooses a property to measure, the quantum state divides into an array of possible outcomes, like a box with a lot of dividers. So if you have a drawer or box and you put in dividers and, you know, for example, like a cash register, um, or in UK, a till, um, if the drawer has a lot of dividers, one might have pennies, one might have other kinds of coins, et cetera. Um, similarly, a quantum state, once you make, you choose a property to measure, suddenly and miraculously, it divides into all the possible outcomes of that property. So if you choose position, it will divide into all the different position outcomes. And then each has a weighting according to the probability of getting that answer. So it's a weighted array of possibilities. So as von Neumann showed, so the quantum state becomes a box with dividers, and then suddenly the measurement is taken, let's say a position measurement, and the state collapses into one of the many position states with a certain degree of probability. So Einstein famously said, God should not play dice. So that was one issue he had, like that God should not play dice with the universe. Why probability? Why not exactitude? And another peeve that Einstein had about this system was, why should a human being be the one triggering the measurement? You know, what's special about human beings? What if you had a universe with no people? Wouldn't quantum events happen anyway? Why should we think that quantum events have to do with people. And interestingly enough, later John Wheeler adopted the philosophy that people are what 
the ones who trigger quantum measurements, even in the early universe, by looking at the, at the early universe through a telescope, which is kind of a weird idea. But um, von Neumann's orthodox view, also known as the Copenhagen interpretation, says that observation by a human being triggers collapse. So there are a lot of strange things with this model. So we call all these dividers a, a space known as Hilbert space. And sometimes it's mapped out using a graph with the different dimensions. So each axis of the graph represents a different possible outcome. And in some cases, you get an unlimited number of dimensions, an unlimited number of outcomes. And Hilbert also coined this metaphor called Hilbert's Hotel to try to understand infinity. And Hilbert played a lot with the idea of infinity. He was a great mathematician, David Hilbert, yet another genius. <laughs> but Hilbert um, said, imagine a hotel in which every room is full and the hotel flashes a no vacancy sign. But then somebody arrives and perhaps it's raining or snowing and they're, they're really anxious to get a room. And the innkeeper says, don't worry, uh, even though there's no vacancies, I'll make a vacancy for you. And they ask the person in room one to move to room two, and the person in room two to room, move to room three, et cetera, et cetera. And then that person gets a vacancy. And then a few minutes later, a whole squad of, uh, let's say, police force or army with an infinite number of people, so infinite number of police officers and infinite number of soldiers arrives and said, we need housing too. And the innkeeper is a little bit nervous and said, oh, no problem, officers. Um, we'll move the person in room one to room two. We'll move the person in room two to room four. And in fact, we'll move everyone to an even room and then we'll free up all the odd rooms for the sold police officers or soldiers. So then an infinite number of people are accompanied. So infinity is a weird thing. And then, of course, the fact that human beings uh, stimulate this division and trigger its collapse is also really weird. So when Einstein talk, he said, this is really strange. You know, why do you need a human being? What if a mouse could trigger a quantum measurement? Where to draw the line? And uh, Einstein thought that that was ridiculous and absurd. He wanted a objective, deterministic approach to quantum mechanics, but he never reached reached that in his lifetime. He kept trying to develop alternatives, but um, in his dying day, 1955, April, he was still working with a pad of paper and pencil to try to come up with alternatives, but he never did. But um, physicists still strive to try to understand the idea of quantum measurement. Now, attending the lecture was a young student of John Wheeler, Hugh Everett III, who had come to Princeton to study something called game theory, which was another project by John von Neumann. But then he got hooked into the work of John Wheeler. He had a good friend named Charles Misner, who I had the pleasure of meeting uh, some years ago. Misner was another famous student of Wheeler, and Misner hooked Everett into this circle of students of John Wheeler, and they went to a lot of events together, and uh, they spoke about philosophical ideas uh, in Everett's flat in Princeton, his dormitory, and uh, would share sherry and uh, drink some sherry and then uh, talk about ideas. So that was a little circle there. Sadly enough, the last member of that circle uh, passed away recently, which was Charles Misner, but it was a whole group of students who was were a mini philosophical club. So every um, at that you know little circle when um, you know supposedly sloshed, as they said with a little bit of sh sherry, um, started pondering what would happen if quantum collapse never happens? So imagine this uh, person is a lab researcher and she um, is observing the state. It divides into all these position states. And one of them represents an electron being 
two nanometers to the left of a marker, one nanometer to the left of the marker, just on the mark, one nanometer to the right of the marker, two nanometers to the right of the marker. And she divides, I have, this is a picture I got from the internet, but she divides into five copies, not just three copies, and each of them somehow perceives a different outcome. So she, um, her conscious awareness divides, just like as Everett said, an amoeba splits into parts. And imagine an intelligent amoeba, Everett said, splitting into different possibilities. Each of them would believe that they were the original person. So this researcher, each copy, each version believes that she's the original person, the original researcher, and doesn't know about the others. So unlike this photo, um, they don't meet. They are, they are unaware of each other's existence. And that's a really interesting idea from Everett. And Wheeler found that really fascinating because he was trying to come up with ways to try to understand the quantum state of the whole universe. Now, Wheeler was somebody who was a very serious physicist, but he had a lot of students with weird ideas. And he called the combination of uh, credible physics and weird ideas, uh, radical conservatism. That was his philosophy. So start with conservative physics, meaning known equations, known theories, and then extend those theories into something that's a little weird. And sometimes it works out. For example, his uh, earlier student, Richard Feynman, uh, came up with the idea of sum over histories that when electrons interact with each other, they do so many different ways simultaneously. So they, um, in a sense, they take multiple paths at once. And that's called sum over histories. So some of her histories, I mentioned uh, at an earlier talk at FAF, but just to remind you, it's kind of like if you said you were traveling from Philadelphia to New York and somebody said, well, how did you go? And you said, well, I, I took a train, I drove, I took a ca taxi, I took an Uber, I took a lift, and I walked and I bicycled. And you said, well, which way did you go? Well, I did all at once. So... The electrons do that all the time. They take all the paths at once. But we don't see these independent paths. We only see the outcome. So I like I call this a multiverse in a bottle. So it's not a real multiverse because it takes place in this abstract space. It doesn't take place in real space. But it, in some ways, it's a pre precursor uh, to the idea of the multiverse. And Wheeler bought into this idea and... Uh, Feynman became very famous for this. He won the Nobel Prize in part for this idea. And both ideas, Feynman and Wheeler, um, you can look at metaphorically um, in literature by looking at uh, stories in science fiction about uh, multiple realities. For example, the classic story um, The Garden of Working Paths by the great Argentine writer Jorge Luis Borges talks about um, people having different relationships uh, in one branch in the universe, they're friends, and another branch, they're enemies, and so forth. And coincidentally, this story came out in the 1940s, which is around when Feynman proposed the summer for histories. It was translated in the 1950s and 1960s, around when Hugh Everett proposed the multiverse idea. But Borges claimed that he didn't really read modern physics. He didn't know much about physics. So it's really an interesting coincidence. So unlike Feynman's idea, Everett's hypothesis imagines reality actually splitting. And we have a picture here of something I mentioned also in a previous talk, the Schrodinger's cat experiment, where a cat is placed in a box with a Geiger counter, a radioactive sample, and a um, in, in a flask of poison. And if the Geiger counter detects a radioactive decay, then um, the flask is triggered to release and then the cat is poisoned. If not, then the flask is not, um, is not broken. No poison's released and the cat survives. So just like a nuclear sample would be a mixture of the decayed and not decayed, 
in the box until it's open, a cat in a box with such elements would be in a mixed state of alive and dead. And according to the standard uh, interpretation, by opening the box, the sample and the cat would both collapse into uh, one of those two outcomes. Now, of course, if you had any sign that the cat was alive or dead, it would definitely be alive or dead. So this is, in a way, an absurd thought experiment that quantum physicists don't really believe that a cat could be in a mixed state. But in the Everett interpretation, there would be no contradiction because the observer themselves would split and one version would see a living cat and the other would see a dead cat. So that's the implication for the Schrodinger's cat thought experiment for the Everett interpretation. Now, um, shortly thereafter, Niels Bohr came to Princeton. Here's Niels Bohr and here's Hugh Everett. And they were very friendly with each other. And here's uh, Charles Misner, by the way. And these are two of their other friends. And um, Everett tried to convince Bohr to look at his interpretation, but Bohr was stuck in the orthodox view and wouldn't even consider any alternatives because by then Bohr was very famous. He was almost like Danish royalty. He met with the royal family of Denmark a lot. He met with Queen Elizabeth II of, of U the UK and was really like scientific royalty. So he wasn't going to sway from the canon. And Everett was very disappointed that he couldn't convince Bohr to even consider his theory. So nevertheless, um, Wheeler still encouraged uh, Everett to publish his paper and it was published in a edited volume, which was edited by a famous physicist, Bryce DeWitt, who's pictured here. And Bryce DeWitt was a very hard-headed physicist. He didn't uh, take any nonsense, um, but um, when he received the paper, his first reaction was uh, writing back and saying, this is ridiculous. I don't feel any splitting. I don't feel reality split up. And whoever wrote back and said, well, do we feel the earth is turning? Does that mean that Copernicus and Galileo are wrong and the earth is really flat and is not turning? And DeWitt immediately saw the analogy because just like we don't feel the earth turning, if we don't feel our consciousness split into these different realities, then it might still happen anyway, it's just that we don't experience it. And DeWitt responded, touche, young man. You know, in other words, you got me there. And uh, DeWitt popularized the idea, which in 1970, he called the many universes interpretation of quantum mechanics. And that was later changed to the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. And that 1970 is when the idea became popular. DeWitt, uh, Everett, by that time joined the military. Uh, he became involved in the defense industry and completely given up on the idea. But then he was delighted when DeWitt popularized it. He liked the new name and he came to um, a talk in Texas where DeWitt and Wheeler had both moved to in the 1980s and gave a talk about his ideas which was very successful. But sadly enough, uh, he passed away at a fairly young age. Um, and then uh, even more tragically, his he had two children, um, a daughter and a son, and his daughter uh, committed suicide and she thought she would join her father in a parallel universe, which was really tragic. Um, she left, she said that in the suicide note, the son is still alive today. His name is, is Mark Everett. And he founded the rock band, The Eels. And uh, there are a lot of interviews with him about his father's work, about Hugh Everett's work. So around 1970, a Australian physicist who was working in Cambridge, England at the time, Brandon Carter, um, found this idea of a multiverse intriguing and thought, well, maybe this could be used to um, explain the properties of our universe and why our universe has just the right parameters 
for the development of stars and planets and life. And I couldn't find a picture of Brandon Carter when he was a student in his student days, but uh, he was much younger than this photo. Um, and he knew Stephen Hawking and Stephen Hawking thought the idea was intriguing and encouraged him to write a paper about it. So the paper is called The Anthropic Principle. And the paper speculates that our universe is one of an array of many different universes and that ours is the Goldilocks universe. And some of them have too strong gravitation. Some of them have too weak gravitation. Some of them expand too quickly. Some of them expand too slowly. And ours is just right for the formation of stars, planets, and life, and intelligent life. And the reason we're here is because if we were in one of the other universes, uh, life would never have developed and there wouldn't be any people to speak about uh, the universe. So that we're, we're luckily in the one universe which developed structure in just the right way to create intelligent life. So that's the anthropic principle. So that's another use of the multiverse. Um, and then in the 1980s, um, several physicists, including uh, Andre Linde, uh, Paul Steinhardt, Alan Guth, and others, developed the notion of the inflationary era. And this was to, the original idea was to explain why the universe is special without resorting to the multiverse, but ironically ended up triggering more ideas of a multiverse. So in the original idea of inflationary era, you have this period of rapid stretching, rapid expansion in the nascent moments of creation right after the Big Bang. So it's a little bit like um, space being pulled like a sheet, like a wrinkled sheet, and all the irregularities are stretched out as if a sheet was pulled in all directions by somebody and gets rid of all the wrinkles. And it explains why the universe is so smooth, both geometrically and also the fact that if you look in all directions, the number of galaxies is fairly even in all directions, which is a, a, a really interesting problem. Why is the universe about the same in all directions? And inflation explains that because it takes the observable universe today from something like smaller than the size of a proton all the way up to the size of a baseball in a, a burst of exponential expansion. And then that baseball size universe expands slowly and then over 13.8 billion years expands to the size it is today. So, uh, but the remarkable thing is going in a fraction of a second from less than the size of a proton to the size of a baseball is an incredible leap. But it does explain the uniformity of the observable universe, its flatness geometrically and its sameness in all directions. And it also, as a bonus, explains why the universe has structure because it blows up random quantum glitches into larger structures that eventually gravitate and form the seeds of stars and galaxies. But um, Andre Linde showed that a way of triggering inflation is to have these, these energy fields in the early universe and a single energy field of a certain type would create super rapid expansion. But Linde showed that this is relatively easy to do. So, um, so not just in our part of the universe, but in other parts of the universe, the early universe, there could be all these bubbles and that's called internal inflation where you have all these bubbles that are expanding in different rates. Some of them, expand too quickly and just fizzle out that way and don't create any structure. Others expand too slowly and then suddenly burst and contract again. And ours is expanding at just the right rate. So um, we can't detect these bubbles directly, but physicists have speculated that we could detect these indirectly through scars in the cosmic microwave background which is the radio hiss left over from the Big Bang. And these would be seen as scars or imprints in the cosmic background. So um, the cosmic background 
has been plotted out by or mapped out by various probes, most recently WMAP, the Wilkin Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Pre Probe, and the Planck satellite. And you get these hot spots and cold spots, relatively hot and relatively cold. And they tell you evidence of structure. And the idea is to maybe look for star scars of collisions with other bubbles in that background. And that's the research of Hiranya Paris at the University of London and others. And uh, she and her team have been looking for rings in the cosmic microwave backgrounds um, that resemble um, collision spots with other universes. And they found some indication of that, but it wasn't statistically significant. So they're looking more and they're doing more simulations to try to find evidence of these bubble collisions. So the jury is still out on whether or not you can find evidence of in scars of the microwave background of other universes. Another area is in which the multiverse idea is popular is string theory, the idea of replacing particles with tiny energetic strands. And that's used to try to develop a theory of everything that includes all the natural forces. It's somewhat controversial because no one has found any direct evidence of string theory. And furthermore, it takes place in 10 or 11 dimensions. And the idea in string theory is that all but four of these dimensions uh, contract into a tiny shape that's a little bit like a pretzel. And these tiny shapes are called Kalabi Yao manifolds. And it turns out that there are 10 raised to the 500 power, that's meaning 10 followed by 500 zeros, possible ways this can contract, meaning that there are that many different types of string theory, which is an embarrassment of riches because only one of them is our universe. So how can you explain why all these other models are out there? And uh, there's some indication that maybe the multiverse would rule out all but one of these possibilities, but that is very speculative. And related to that is explaining why the universe has a small but non-zero cosmological constant. Cosmological constant is an anti-gravity term that was introduced by Einstein in 1917 to stabilize his model of the universe because he thought the universe should be static. But then when he discovered the universe is expanding, he got rid of that term which was to balance out gravity to stabilize the universe. And he said, oh, the universe is really expanding. I don't need that stabilizing term. But people remembered it and remembered that it can serve to act counter to gravity. And then in 1998, two teams of astronomers discovered cosmic acceleration. They discovered that the universe is not just expanding, but it's speeding up in its acceleration. They used a supernova as ways of measuring the speed of distant galaxies to arrive at that conclusion. And here's what they found. Instead of the universe expanding and then collapsing or expanding and slowing down its expansion, it actually speeds up in its expansion. So it gets faster and faster. Uh, this is a bit of a technical chart, So, but the idea is that the universe is speeding up in its expansion. And... For that to happen, we need a tiny but non-zero cosmological constant. And the reason it has to be tiny is because it kicks in only after structure is already formed in the universe. So it becomes significant only after stars, galaxies, planets, Earth, you name it, have formed. And then once they formed, the cosmological constant eventually becomes um, significant and starts pushing the galaxies away from each other. Um, but by then, structures have already formed. Luckily, because if it happened before structures had formed, if it was a large cosmological constant, we wouldn't see, we wouldn't have any structure. So there wouldn't be planets and we wouldn't be here. And this is one of the instruments trying to look at the distant universe and measure its dynamics, the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, launched a couple of years ago. Oops, conclusion. Um, 
multiverse in fiction and science are very different. The Marvel multiverse is very different than the scientific multiverse. And as I mentioned, there's many different types of scientific multiverses. The many worlds idea of Everett, the anthropic principle of Brandon Carter, eternal inflation proposed by Andre Linde and others, and string theory multiverse proposed by people like Leonard Susskind and, and others. So for more about the multiverse, please pick up a copy of my book, which is available at bookshops around the world, sure. online at um, allureofmultiverse.com. And also our local place, if you're in the Philadelphia area, Wayne, Pennsylvania, Main Point Books. If you want a personally autographed copy, just contact them, order it through their site, uh, which I think the link is post, posted in the chat room. And um, and then just say you want it personally inscribed and I will drive out there if it's not snowing or icy and personally autograph the copy for you. Um, if you buy it on uh, others through other sites, I'm not, you'll, it's still available, but you wouldn't, wouldn't be personally autographed. So anyway, that's uh, it for my talk. Uh, I'd be glad to answer any questions. Uh, so let me look at the chat room. Um, yeah, just uh, want to remind people to just uh, type questions onto the chat uh, area. I'll just uh, prime the whole chat discussion with a question. Um, I don't know if you referred to this in terms of imprinting and scars. Penrose's theory of a prior reality, big holes, might have made a map in that background radiation or perhaps that's uh what the woman was that you mentioned who was a scientist from england was looking for did, did you have thought, well, thoughts on that Paul? uh i mentioned that in my book that roger penrose doesn't like the multiverse idea he prefers something called the uh, the cyclic conformal cosmology ccc he's a professor at oxford he's in his 90s now I proposed that the universe goes through different cycles and he proposed that you also see scars of previous cycles of black hole collisions or otherwise in the microwave background radiation, but nobody has detected those either. But other teams of astronomers are looking for those. Um, so, uh, so that is another uh, type of exploration, another theory that's an alternative to multiverse ideas. And finally, I should mention that Paul Steinhardt, Neil Turek have their own uh, idea of uh, cycles using um, higher dimensional universes colliding with each other. And uh, Neil Turek has gone on to say that maybe there's a multiverse in which the universe at the Big Bang, one part of it goes forward in time, the other goes backward in time. I talk about all these ideas in my book. So let me look at some of the messages. We want okay. to remind people to put uh, Q in. So <laughs> Ellen has one there right at the bottom. Okay. So uh, there's mention of book Big Bang episode with um, alternative uh, realities. Um, Al Nathan mentions uh, uh, taking an independent cor study course with Misner. And then there's other ideas, other mentions of Misner. It was sad that he passed away recently. Um, Schrodinger actually had a dog, not a cat. So I'm looking for now for cues. Okay. Rolling dice. Okay. Question. From Alan Vincent Michaels. Since the universe seems to be cyclical based on the Big Bang event, um, is it possible that there was a previous universe? What about that effect on the multiverse constant and the conservation of energy and mass? Um, well, that is controversial. Not everyone believes that the universe was cyclical. The believers in internal inflation believe that there was one Big Bang, but multiple bubbles. So they don't believe that there was anything before the Big Bang. Um, but... Paul Steiner, <laughs> excuse me. 
um, Paul Steinhardt has this idea of um, of cycles with higher dimensional collisions, and then Roger Penrose has this idea that mathematically the universe would reset. So those are the two leading psych cyclical models or cyclical models uh, today. Um, so movie multiverses, parallel threads of time. Um, so in movie multiverses, these other universes are super accessible and they're very slightly different from ours, but the differences are really subtle. Like maybe New York City has different skyscrapers or, um, you know, there's some kind of different, um, you know, tone in, in the movie that sometimes they use different um, lit, different kinds of lighting, uh, different anime, types of animation. They're, the differences are really subtle. So in science, the closest multiverse would either be, if you believe in the many worlds, a version of you that you could never possibly access because it would be in a different abstract reality. So you would never meet that person. And they would have for only very subtle differences like one of them might measure an electron to be one nanometer to the left of a detector. The other would rep measure it to be one nanometer to the right of the detector. So it would be kind of a boring discussion, you know, debate if you could meet that person because they would just have very, very subtle differences in their memories. Um, not that they would, one would be good and one would be evil. Um, Scott Snell had the free will question. Did I miss miss that one? Yeah, uh, Scott Snell said the notion of free will presumed not to exist. Uh, could there be any relevance to that in quantum mechanics? Okay, I'm trying to find that question. Is that one of the later questions? Oh, yeah. here, that's one of the later questions. Okay. Um, well, uh, interestingly, neither quantum mechanics or classical mechanics includes free will. You have to add that in. Uh, classical me mechanics in the Newtonian model, if you obey it strictly, it's completely deterministic. There's no free will. But mind you, Newton himself was very religious and thought that um, God could intervene with miracles at any moment. And so, for example, God might um, create the laws of gravity and then just say, okay, let's put Earth in just the right position near the sun to give it just the right amount of warmth and cold to create life. So God keeps intervening. So sometimes that's, that idea is called the God of the gaps. Um, but um, quantum physics substitutes determinism for probability, but it doesn't include free will, except if you believe in the choice of the measurer affects things. Um, but, uh, but Max Born, who coined the term quantum mechanics, believed strongly in free will, and he was upset with Einstein for believing in determinism and said, look, you need quantum mechanics with probability even to allow for free will. You can't have a deterministic theory. So that's what the relevance lies. But I skipped a couple questions, so I'm going back. Uh, how does physics address the conservation of mass energy? It doesn't. Um, it, in quantum physics, uh, you don't. You have uh, subtle uh, violations of conservation of mass and energy on the particle scale, and it, you can actually have something from nothing. You have this energy field, and it bubbles into existence through sheer chance, and then it triggers the universe to go, undergo super rapid expansion, and that creates all sorts of a huge amount of gravitational energy. And then when that expansion stops that gravitational energy turns into mass and you create a huge number of particles. So we believe in the inflationary model that um, that all the particles in the universe today were created after this ultra rapid expansion opened up, you know, created all this energy, extra energy. So it, it's kind of a weird idea. So conservation of mass and energy does not always apply. It applies sometimes, but not always. And, and I don't really know uh, uh, why rolling 100 dice would result in the same roll most of the time. 
um, that would be some would be um, most common combination, more common combinations, but I'm not sure what it'd be most of the time the same role. Um, that might just be the center of a Gaussian distribution. Yeah, the center, but that would, would be just be a tiny probabilistic. That would be yeah. Um, I guess I guess the plurality of the time rather than the majority of the time. And thanks to Fred Schufer for his comment. Um, David Cattell, what's the status of the extra dimensions of string theory? Well, a lot of theorists still believe in it. And um, I've talked to theorists, um, not so recently, but um, when I interviewed Bryce DeWitt uh, about 20 years ago, so that's a while ago, but before he passed away, he said that was really the only game in town, string theory. And a lot of theorists believe that string theory is the only way to explain, the only way to unify the forces of nature, because in particle physics, strictly particle physics, you've got these infinite terms which are irremovable, whereas in string theory, um, you don't get infinite terms. It's completely finite. But then the problem is it only lives mathematically in 10 or more dimensions. Otherwise, then you get all these other inconsistencies. So um, physicists have been hoping <coughs> for some evidence from, from the Large Hadron Collider to bolster string theory, but so far they haven't found anything. So it's a bit contentious. And some physicists talk about building an even larger collider to find low energy indication of string theory. Um, so it's controversial, but people are still working on it. And uh, good to see you too, David. Um, um, I, I don't comment on unidentified aerial phenomenon. That's not in my purview. I don't really think that that would ex would be a glimpse into alternate alternative and parallel universes because, as I said, they would either be inaccessible or extremely far away from us. Um, inaccessible in the quantum version, and billions and billions and billions, maybe trillions of light years away from us in the cosmology version. Robert Schwartz, what if a human observer was inside Schrodinger's box? Wow, that's pretty cruel, but with a gas mask. Uh, well, it's a thought experiment. Then um, the human being would be quant in a quantum superposition with the cat. Um, but uh, but the cat would be in, cat would be in a superposition. But um, that's a weird thing because then the human would be an observer inside the box. So maybe the cat would be, in that case, in a definitive state because, and then the observer, the observer would be in an undefined state um, until the box is open and the observer can report the result. So the observer would not see a superposition, but then someone outside would see the superposition. And that sometimes was proposed by Witness called the Schrodinger's friend paradox. So here's, yeah, so here's a response by Sanjay. Thank you, Sanjay. Uh, are we? Aren't you delighted to exist? Yes, emphatically. Yes, it's uh, lovely to be in this universe. And uh, it's it's really amazing that chance led us to in a universe with um, ostensibly intelligent people. Some would debate that, but I think we're in, we're an intelligent intelligent group of people, especially the people in this audience. Um, would quantum collapse more scale results and more regular outcomes? Uh, there'd be some way of predict of predicting the probability. It becomes a statistical question. Ah, that's, I think, all the questions, unless I missed any. Any more um, questions? Yeah, it, it, in that case, on uh, behalf of fact, I'll thank you uh, so much for 
giving such a great presentation. I, I, I love the little slides that I imagine you uh, made up yourself. It's yes. such a great way to visualize these really deep, heavy concepts. Uh, is there a, a book per chance that might come after this one? Or are you already thinking about the, the next one, Paul? Well, this version of me is too exhausted to start writing a new book, but I can't really vouch for other versions of me. So if you're in a different reality, I might already be working on, <laughs> on a new book. Uh, there, there's also a reference to uh, uh, Shermer having spoken with you recently with a YouTube link. That'd be a cool uh, c conversation. I I love hearing Shermer that I'll, I'll have to tune into that one myself. Yeah, there's a lot out there. If you Google uh, my, the title of my book or my name, on the past few weeks, there's been a lot of stuff, uh, including um, including my selection for the top 10 multiverse uh, movies, reviews of my book, uh, my talk with Michael Shermer, my talk with Alan Boyle and Cosmic Log, uh, another of, number of other podcasts. Um, if you follow my twitter slash x feed as i know some of you do i post links and i apologize to those on that feed for being so much of a promoter um i i i guess i'm a little bit overly cautious to make sure that the word gets out about um my books because i had bad experience uh with uh my book that came out in the year 2000 pursuit of destiny which i worked on for a couple of years and then somehow the word never got out about it and it only sold a couple hundred copies and it was immediately pulled from distribution. And it was a big disappointment to me. And uh, since then, I've been a lot more, try to be a lot more savvy about getting the word out about my books. But if you're on my social media feeds, I apologize for being so pushy about it. And uh, I try to, to, uh, include uh, a lot of other things too in the social media feed about you know little historical facts that come up with and things like that about Einstein and others uh, so please if you uh, if you're on uh, at Twitter X follow me I know some people don't like the leadership of that um, website mm -hmm. I'm also on Blue Sky and Mastodon but I don't get as much uh, traffic on those but I, I go on those occasionally and uh, there's a Facebook page uh, that's um, that's out there too, which is a author page that I'm not active on. And uh, let's see, I'll say join something called Post News, but I think I've I've been on there a couple of times. I'm not on Threads yet. I'm not on Instagram. I'm not on uh, TikTok. So, but there's always possibility of other. Uh, other times. And I should mention, uh, weirdly enough, please don't purchase these, but I found out that uh, someone, at least two groups of people recently used chat GPT or some other AI algorithm to um, write fake biographies of me. And out of curiosity, I downloaded one. And, and even though it mentions my books correctly, it had a completely made up biography of me which said I was born in Los Angeles which I wasn't and said that I uh, was influenced in my youth by meeting Hawking and Penrose at Cambridge which didn't happen and so forth it was it was flattering but a false biography and then after I saw that uh, I noticed there was another I think chat GPT false biography um, that I haven't even bothered to download I don't know what's in it but it's very strange and, uh, you know, at least they're flattering, but to try to sell, to sell books, but, um, you know, it's a little bit weird the day, the day and age we live in that someone can just use AI to make up stuff. So I strongly urge buy a real book written by a real author, if possible support independent bookshops and, uh, you know, and, uh, these are all good things, uh, you know, real writing, real creativity. And if, you know, also uh, follow your dream um, for um, 
you know, for whatever creative endeavor you're involved in. It's my personal advice. Well, Alan sums up, I think, the mood of all of us. Uh, go ahead and promote your works. Uh, be shameless in that. We, we we definitely need need that voice. And again, uh, th thanks so much for all that you do to get human beings to use our wonderful uh, minds and keep us all thinking. And uh, remind our audience, join us uh, third Saturday, 2 p.m. in February for our, our, our next speaker and uh, stay connected to our Twitter feed, email, uh, and meetup groups. So, uh, well, thank, thank you, you all, and uh, thank you, Eric. And it's delightful to be on fact. And thank you for those of you who are in other parts of the U.S. and other countries for tuning in. And uh, it was great seeing you all. Okay, uh, take care, all.